appreciate, because I never really know what those men are going to read uh, in the reading before we receive the scripture. I really appreciate Zach's reading of that passage for us this morning. Um, some of you do or some of you don't know this, but for about 15 days we've been doing that grandmommy and grandpappy thing. And uh, we had Alistair for like seven days, and he's two years old. Sent him home the day he left. Uh, Evelyn, our uh, 16-month-old granddaughter, arrived. And uh, so I just noticed when he was reading that scripture, I looked down, and I have a jacket that doesn't even match these pants. Somehow or another, <laughs> somehow or another, uh, I have two black suits, but they're not the same two black suits. Right? <laughs> so I'm sitting there going, this is really bothering If you knew me, that would bother me. But Pastor Zach exhorted me not to let that be something to fret over, right? <laughs> Not to worry about that. Because that really in the end, yeah, you wouldn't know, but I would. <laughs> and, uh, and, and as most of you know, Pam's uncle uh, passed away. And so she's away, headed to LaGrange, Georgia, to be with their family there. So this is why I'm not going to fret this afternoon, because Josiah and I have Evelyn, right? <laughs> and so we are going to be taking care of Evelyn this afternoon. So we definitely need to remember not to fret. Well, church, let's take our Bibles. Let's come to our study in the book of Job. And please turn in your Bibles to Job chapter 32. Job chapter 32. And as we come to Job 32, I want to really just say a couple of things. First of all, as we today are coming to the last message in this mini-series in the book of Job called When God is Silent. This is the end of what we'll do in that second of those series that we are doing and on this note, I want to just tell you how encouraged I have been that through this section of the book of Job, that uh, your words of encouragement to me had just been so, so sweet and so wonderful. From our own church, someone wrote to me, the Lord has used Job like never before in my life. Thank you for helping us to understand what for years has been a bit vague. And then someone who joins us away from this place, uh, from Texas, writes this rather encouraging note. Oh my, I took two hours and listened to both messages from the book of Job that you preached on. They were amazing. I've read the book of Job, but you really helped me to have a better understanding of, message, of the messages the friends of Job shared with him. But the most exciting part I received from the message were the why question sermons. And what did I do to deserve this? It reminded me that each time I ask, not only am I doubting God's ability to do His work in me, but also I'm looking in the past and I need to be looking in the future. I need to look ahead at what God is doing in my life. Most of the time I get it, but your messages were so clear and there is no looking back. So incredible work that God is doing to use this study that we've been in together in the book of Job. And I want you to have your Bible marked there to chapter 32 where we're going to come to. But let's just remind ourselves as we come to this chapter today, which we're not, don't fret. Can y'all bring me some batteries? <laughs> yeah, just click it for me, Zach, if you will, please. It is a rough morning. So how do we get to chapter 32? They're very briefly described in the notes there. The first thing we did is we met Mr. Job. Remember, that was chapters 1 and 2, a chapter that kind of helped us understand the setting of the book of Job. Here is a man who is not sinless, but he is a genuine believer who is suffering. He is not perfect, but he is a genuine believer. And he is not in this predicament because he has suffered. His life has been turned upside down. He doesn't know that God and Satan have had this conversation. But we know, right? We know that. And we, the reader, can realize that what he's going through is not because of anything he has done wrong, but because God has a sovereign purpose for his life. The second thing I want you to know is after we study those first two chapters there, that that didn't take away Job's sorrow. Because in chapter 3, five times in that chapter, Job keeps asking the question, why is this going on? Remember, Job doesn't know about the conversation between God and Satan. All he can do is observe his circumstances. He's lost all ten of his children, all of his wealth, his name, everything is gone. And he is in misery and grief, wondering what happened in his life. 
the next thing we learned as we looked at the next big section was Job chapters 4 through 37. And that shows us where Job's friends went wrong. You'll remember there are four cycles of conversations that Job and these three friends have. And they're all pretty much the same kind of message. They are an accusatory message to Job telling him that what he has done is obviously sin or he wouldn't be going through something just like that. Thank you very much. And so these accusatory speeches are trying to answer Job's why questions. And that led us to where we were last Sunday, where we came to chapter 28. We said there's really no need to keep looking at all the speeches of Job's friends from chapters 4 to 37 because they're basically, after the first cycle, saying the same thing. But what we did do is we came to chapter 28 of Job, and that's where we found ourselves at this point able to look at a unique chapter in the book of Job that really just kind of pauses and gives us, the reader, some insight to why God doesn't answer the why questions. And so when we come to this chapter here that where Job's friends are really, truly struggling with trying to give him an answer, the writer says, if you want God's word and God's wisdom, then it's not found in all the places you might think to look. Your money will not help you figure out why you're going through this. You can pay all you want to whoever you want to, but it won't help you. And your own human ingenuity and thinking, well, if I just dig hard enough and search hard enough, I'll figure this out. And that chapter 28 told us that you cannot obtain the wisdom of God by any of those human means. The only way you will make sense of your why questions and your struggles is if you embrace what wisdom tells us to do, and that is to trust in the Lord. To turn to Him. To in one sense say, if I never know why it's going the way it is, why my world is turned upside down, why things have gone sideways, I am happy and I am content to know that I have Him. And He will see me through it. And that brings us this morning to chapter 32. And chapter 32 here is what I want us to look at as we think about here this the very important passage here. You know what, guys, we have the wrong PowerPoint back there. This is really the fret day, right? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, well, just turn that off. Because I kept wondering, what in the world are these quotes coming up for? That's not right. Just turn the screen off. We're all good. You better pay close attention because we have 144 verses, six <laughs> chapters to look at this morning. Zach could not have picked a better, better text to read this morning. It's all good. Amen. Don't fret. God's got this. I guarantee you that's right. Amen. Well, so that brings us to then where we are in chapter 32 this morning, right? We've kind of quickly reminded ourselves there in your notes how we got there. And as we come to chapter 32, I want you to notice that this chapter and these six chapters together are really going to help us in a way that maybe you never thought they would. As we come to this chapter, we're going to be introduced to a man by the name of Elihu. And I want you to meet this guy and get to know this guy because he's a guy you would kind of really never thought of to be the man who would speak something helpful to Job. And as you come to chapter 32, notice right up in verse 40, if you'll notice there, it says something that that, that chapter ends with. It says, the words of Job are what? ended so in other words Job for all these chapters has been having dialogues back and forth with his three friends they would tell him why they thought he was suffering he would respond and say but that's not true that's not right and so in chapter 31 the words of Job are ended and now in chapter 32 we meet a man named Elihu and Elihu for six chapters, 144 verses, is going to say something to Job. And listen very carefully. Job, in this case, is not going to respond at all. If you just flip your Bible over several chapters, look at chapter 38. The next person to talk after Elihu gets through saying what he's going to say to Job in chapter 38, the next thing is this. Then the Lord answered Job. So all the friends from chapters 4 to 37 have been trying to make sense of Job's why questions. They haven't helped Job. They've only made him more miserable by their unbalanced, inaccurate views of his suffering. Job is finished in chapter 31 saying anymore. He's done talking. 
Elihu comes in and talks from chapter 32 to chapter 36. And then finally God in chapter 38 speaks, which will be what will kick off our next series, When God Speaks. We've seen our world turned upside down. We've seen God be silent in the second series. And the third series is going to be When God Speaks. What does He say? And we have to ask ourselves a couple of questions about this section to get us ready for what Elihu is going to say. First of all, I want you to think about the man here in chapter 32, Elihu. Who is this man? Where has he been? Well, here's what we know. We know, as we read the first five verses in just a minute, that Elihu has been there all along as Job's three friends have been sharing their thoughts and Job's been responding. So it's not like Elihu finally shows up to the scene. No, he's been there. He's been listening. He's been hearing everything they have said. And so he's now going to say something after hearing what Job said, after what the friends have said. But you need to know something very carefully about Elihu. This man, not everybody agrees about who he is and whether he's right in what he is saying. I don't know about you, but when I study the Bible, I like to get get to that level of my commentaries and my reading, and and I find that all the commentators, whoever I'm reading, are saying the same things about the passage you're reading, right? That's always encouraging. That means you must have got it right. Well, when you read the commentators, all the thinkers, the smart people, about Elihu's life, they don't agree about him at all. Some thinks he's very angry and very sinful. Others think he's righteous in his concerns. Some think that what he says is somewhat sarcastic to him. And others are thinking, no, he's very sympathetic. So I just want you to know that when you think of him, you won't think of him as everybody thinks of him. What I want you to do is kind of look at this man here and understand some very important things. And here's the first thing in verses 1 through 5 as we read it. See if you can note it. Then these three men, that's the three friends, ceased answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. But the anger of Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzite, of the family of Ram, burned. Against Job his anger burned because he justified himself before God. And his anger burned against his three friends because they had found no answer and yet had condemned Job. Now Elihu had waited to speak to Job because they were years older than he. And when Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of uh, these three men, his anger burned. So Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzzite, spoke out and said. Now let's note something. The very first thing you know about this man is that Elihu is angry at Job and, and Job's three friends. If you're taking notes, you should note that and make sure that you're clear about that. Four times in five verses, the writer tells us that he is angry. He is angry at Job's three friends. Now, is this righteous anger? Is this sinful anger? We're just going to leave that to our discussion at a later time. The point is, is that here is a man who is not for sure a perfect man. I love the way that Douglas O'Donnell writes about him. Elihu is a flawed prophet, but not a false prophet. This is important to understand because what he is telling us is that he's not a perfect spokesman and and you don't have to be completely all together and everything right to pass on some good stuff to other people. So Elihu is flawed. He's probably angry, sinfully, and righteous back and forth like we often get when we're struggling through things and dealing with people. But he's not a false prophet. What he's going to say to him is going to be very, very important. The second thing I want you to know about this man here is that what he has to say here is probably the longest speech that has ever been offered by any of his friends. He gets six chapters, 144 verses. I don't know about you, but if after chapters 4 to 37, where Job's friends have been trying to convince him why they think he's struggling and his suffering is going on as it is, and then Job says, okay, I'm done. I've said everything I'm going to say. In my opinion, the next thing that would happen would be chapter 38. Then the Lord spoke to him, right? That would make so much sense to me. But for some reason, God has determined in this inspired word, in this book, that Elihu is going to get six long chapters. And I asked myself, what in the world could he say? 
In fact, if you just glance down, we won't read them for the sake of time today, but if you look at chapter 32, verses 6 to 22, the entire rest of chapter 32 is just Elihu introducing himself and telling Job why he's going to talk and why he's going to say something. He just goes on and on and on in chapter 32 saying, this is who I am, this is what I'm going to say, and this is why you need to listen to me. I was thinking as I was reading through that passage this week, about Elihu spending a whole chapter just to introduce himself and never really yet getting to the point, I would imagine that a friend of mine, Jeff Colon, who is from New York, would have probably responded to an Elihu like this. Okay, already, man, get it out. Say it, right? (laughs) Say what you've got to say. Would you just say it already, right? But But he lingers for a whole chapter introducing himself. And then in chapter 33 to chapter 37... He's going to unfold some incredible truths that he wants Job to know. And we need to understand. He's not going to just add to some things that his friends have said. He's going to say something the three friends have never said and maybe we've never, ever considered. So here's what I want you to think about here. Here's what he's going to do. He's, first of all, in these chapters, this is important to get the big picture here, he's going to lay down an important biblical principle. And the important biblical principle that you and I need to understand as we think about suffering and we think about the trials in our life is that God speaks on his own time. Because remember, chapter 31, Job is done. Chapter 38, God could have said, now let me speak to you, Job. But God delays for six long chapters at least to teach us a very important principle here. And that is that God will speak And give answers when he is ready. This passage here was was helpful to me as I read, read David Atkinson's words. He says, we have heard Job's passion at last stand. The words of Job have ended. We're waiting for the Lord. And these chapters give us space between Job and Yahweh. They illustrate just by being there that Yahweh is not forced into a quick reply by the intensity of Job's entreaties. God acts in his own time. He's not at a human beck and call. He comes down his own secret stair, and in his sovereign and gracious care, he decides the timing of his intervention. Now that, brothers and sisters, is a very critical point to get about who Elihu is. God is using him to remind us all that you and I might plead, we might fast, we might pray, we might say, God, I'm serious now, speak to me. And we expect God is going to then talk to us and give us answers. But listen very carefully. God is under no obligation to respond to the rightful, necessary, and most intense cryings of our heart to respond on that time to- timeline. He, I love the way David Atkinson puts it, God comes down his own secret stair. We was expecting God was going to answer me this way. Oh, but here's how he brought the answer to me and showed me what I needed to know about my why questions and my struggles and all that I was going through. So we should, we should, we should remember that Elihu, this long section on his speeches is to remind us that when God is ready, chapter 38, then God will speak. We shouldn't fall prey to the thinking, if I could just get enough faith, pray hard enough, and get all the people I could around me to join me in prayer, that somehow or another we'll get God's arm behind his back, and he'll say, okay, uncle, uncle, I give. I'll tell you the answer now. Don't think like that, because that is not how the sovereign God works. He comes down his own secret stair. He's got a time. He's got a way. He's going to speak. He's going to address the issues as needed, but... He comes in his own gracious time. So what is this doing for us? It is reminding us, first of all, of this very important principle that God speaks on his own time. Secondly, it's preparatory for what God will say when he speaks to Job in chapter 38. What I mean by this is that whatever Elihu is going to say must be, in God's opinion, necessary for Job to hear and for us to hear so that when God speaks in chapter 38, we're ready to listen. It's preparatory. So what are those things that Elihu is going to say? Well, this is where we're going to quickly walk through six chapters, 144 verses, in about 10 minutes. So get your pen ready and let's do it, all right? Because it is necessary when you see these four things 
to understand that when your heart gets there, no matter how much you have pled with God, no matter how much you have cried out for answers and you want Him to, to show you, to talk to you, to help you grasp what you need to grasp, but He's just silent He's not speaking. These four things are preparatory so that when He does show what you what you need to know from His Word, you're ready to hear it. You know, brothers and sisters, to be honest with you, we often say, hey, I want to hear what God wants me to hear. But the reality is, that's often just a verbal acknowledgement. In our hearts, we just don't want to wait. We're ready. We don't want to wait on that time when God comes down His stair to come say and show what He needs to, to do, say and do. We want to have it right now. So, four things. Here we are. Are you ready? The first one is in chapter 33. The second one will be in chapter 34. The third one will be in chapter 35. And the fourth one will be in chapters 36 and 37. And at best, all I can do is just point these out to you and hope that you'll read the passage around it or you have already read it and you'll understand what is being said here. The first thing I want you to note in chapter 33 is this. Even when life is confusing, God is still communicating. Well, that's important to know because Job is crying out to God, why is this going on? And, and he thinks that God is not speaking and God is not communicating. God is not relating to him. But the fact of the matter is that we see in chapter 33 that he absolutely has. I want to give you three quick ways that in this passage we see that God has been communicating with Job. Are you ready? First of all, Elihu reminded Job that God was speaking to him through his dreams. Look in chapter 33, verse 13. Why do you complain against him that he does not give an account of all his doings? Indeed, God speaks once or twice, yet no one notices it. In a dream, a vision of the night, when sound sleep falls on men while they slumber in their beds, when he, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction, that he may turn man aside from his conduct and keep man from the pride. He keeps back his soul from the pit and his life from passing into Sheol. Let us hold right there for just a moment. In these verses, for Job's time, and this is critical that you hear this, in Job's time... One of the means that God spoke and revealed himself to people was through dreams. You've got to remember the book of Job is probably the oldest book in your Bible written probably before Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's one of those original early books that probably was first penned. Remember Job's story comes into play somewhere around the life of Abraham. So we go way back in the timeline and back then Job doesn't have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He does not have a Bible to hold in his hands. So one of the means that God uses to communicate to people in those days would be through dreams. Now listen very carefully to this. We're going fast. But that is not how God communicates to us today. Those dreams were equally revelatory, just like God spoke from heaven and it was pinned down in the Bible. What we have is all the revelation of God. Everything we need, as 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, everything we need for life and godliness are given to us in the exceeding precious promises of the Bible. God has spoken. God has revealed everything He wants us to know in the Bible. But before that, God would reveal Himself through dreams. Now, that's an important point for you to grasp because you can go to the Christian bookstore and there are tons of books on the shelves trying to help us figure out how to interpret our dreams. People have asked me so many times, Pastor Kevin, I had this dream. What do you think it means? I look at him, I said, I have no idea. You think God was saying something to me? I go, there's, there's no reason to think that that is God speaking to you because you had a dream. In short, what I think happens in dreams are is your conscience is at that point to where it's thinking about and, and living out and vividly, often in dreams, things that you have thought about, things that you've considered. That's what your dreams do. They're not God speaking to you and telling you something. They're just God taking what you've already experienced, what you've read in the Bible possibly, and those things just come to life. Listen, I've preached, I don't know how many thousands of sermons in my dreams. Because I'm studying the Bible, I'm reading the Bible, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about its truth, and I'll dream about that kind of stuff. It's just like the person who said, you know what, I had this horrible dream about hell the other night. I go, well, why did you, why did you dream that? 
well, I had been hearing messages about God's judgment on sinners and hell, and, and I just had it on my mind, and I was thinking about it, and it just came to life in my dreams. That was not God speaking to them. That was God highlighting what the Word of God already was saying to that person. So Job just needs to understand, and I need to explain that to you so you don't walk out of here saying, oh, in my suffering, I might have a dream and God will say something to me. Your dream at best will only uh, clarify, or I should say identify, and put on display vividly, probably in your mind, stuff that you are thinking about, right or wrong, and what God's Word really, if it reminds you of that, it's just bringing you back to the Bible. So Job needs to know that God is speaking to him. Not through dreams. And you should sometimes note that passage in Isaiah 8, verses 19 and 20, where the people are going to try to get an answer from uh, the mediums through dreams and visions and things. And God says, go to the law, go to the testimonies of Scripture. That's where I'm going to speak to you. That's a very important thing to remember. But Job is being reminded by Elihu. What do you mean? God isn't bringing back to your memory things that you know about God. Sure he is. You're having dreams about it. So God is speaking to him. Number two, Job is being reminded by Elihu that God was speaking to him through his suffering. Look at verse 19 in chapter 33. Man is also chastened with a pain on his bed and with unceasing complaint in his bones so that his life loathes bread and his soul's favorite food. His flesh wastes away from sight and the bones which were not seen stick out. Then his soul draws near to the pit and the life to those who bring death. How many of you know this? That whenever suffering and struggles come into your life, it absolutely draws you to seek God in a way like you didn't before? That's exactly what's happening in Job's life here. He is being reminded here that God himself is actually speaking to him in the sense that he is drawing him to him and turning him to cry out to him and he's using suffering for that to happen you know C.S. Lewis wasn't it who said that uh, that God whispers to us in life but in our suffering he shouts there's something about pain that grabs your attention that says you know what this is hard in my life and it's going to cause me to turn to him so I can hear what God wants me to hear So though this is confusing, Job, he says, I want you to know that when you lay down in bed at night and you're dreaming, you're thinking about things that you know about God, things things he's revealed to you about himself. He is communicating with you. He's not saying what you want to hear right now, but he is not distant, and he is communicating with you. And even your suffering is drawing you to hear him and be ready to listen to what he has to say. Two things I want to put up there for you that I think that this might be a reminder to us about. One, God might have sent Job this suffering, not because he had sinned, but to keep him from sinning. That's a great reminder that Job should need to know here, that God is speaking to you, Job, and what he's telling you as a reminder is this, that when you, though you didn't sin and get yourself in this mess, suffering and struggles have a way of making you take your life more seriously. I referenced for you there the passage in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, where the Apostle Paul had this thorn in his flesh. He asked God to take it away three times, and you know what God said to him is, no, I'm not going to take it away. And why did he not take it away? So that Paul might remain humble. He said, God gave that so that I might, because of the revelation of truth that Paul had and knew, would not exalt himself and become arrogant and proud. So there is something that really can be said about suffering in that it keeps us from going in a way of like Paul in pride or arrogance or some other sin. That's just what suffering does. God's speaking to us and saying, I want to tell you something, a very important thing. This suffering is reminding you that it will keep you pursuing me and away from things that you might be falling into in your sin. The second thing it does is that suffering not only keeps a person from going wayward, it causes him to learn the ways of God. It gives his attention and turns him to God so that he will say, I'm ready to hear what you have to say. That's why the psalmist said in 119, verse 67 and 71, before I was afflicted, what does he say there? I went astray. That affliction just kept me from going wayward and going off the path that I should go on. So, the first thing that we see is that God is 
communicating with Job, even though life is confusing. He doesn't understand why he's going through this. God is speaking to him in Job's case through dreams, through his suffering, number two. And number three, he is reminding Job that God was speaking to him through others. If you just glance down at verses 23 through 37 in chapter 33, you will see here that he talks about in verse 23, if there is an angel as a mediator for him, one out of a thousand, to remind a man what is right for him. And he goes on and explains what this angel does. Now listen carefully. The word angel there just means messenger. Whether this is an angel like we think of angels or one sent as a messenger. When Paul in the New Testament said that an angel, a messenger was sent to him, it could be possibly just a person that was causing such pain in his life. But the reality is, is that God was using others to speak to Job. We don't know who they were, but God uses others. And so the point that we want to nail down and say this, is that when you're struggling with suffering and you're wondering, why am I going through this? Why is God not speaking to me? First of all, look at the things that you can see where God is already speaking to you. He's reminding you of things that you know about Him. Your suffering is causing you to turn to Him and really cry out to Him and, and want to seek Him more desperately. And your suffering has probably brought some people in your life who have reminded you of great things that you need to remember. That's the first thing. When life is confusing, God is still communicating. If we can't get that clear in our minds, then we won't be ready to hear what God's going to say in chapter 38 when he finally does speak. Number two, and very quickly. The second thing here we note is that even when life is unfair, Elihu wants him to know that God is never unjust. That's what chapter 34 is about. Even when life is unfair, God is never unjust. What Elihu does is he reminded Job that God always does what is right. In chapter 34, verses 10 through 12. Therefore, he says, listen to me, you men of understanding. Far be it from God to do wickedness and from the Almighty to do wrong. So what he says to him is, I want you to know, Job, that realistically, that whenever we go through those troubles that we go through, it may feel like it's unfair. Why, if I'm serving you like Job is serving you, are you letting me go through that? I may not know the answer to the why of that question, but I do know this. God isn't being unjust. And he wants Job to remember that. The second thing he reminds Job here of is that whenever you go through those times, Job, you, when you're discouraged, you need to remember the character of God. The character of God. Look at what he says in verse 13 and 14. Who gave him authority over the earth? Speaking of God, and who has laid on him the whole world? If he should determine to do so, if he should gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together and man would return to dust. Verse 17, shall one who hates justice rule? And will you condemn the righteous mighty one who says to a king, worthless one, to nobles, wicked ones, who shows no partiality to princes nor regards the riches above the poor? For they, shall, they are all the work of his hand. What is he saying to him here? He is saying things like this. Job, you need to know that God is the one who is in sovereign authority. The kings, the rulers, everybody is under his control. You need to know in verses 14 and 15 that he is the independent sustainer of life. He is in himself completely sustained in himself. In verses 17 to 20, he rules without any partiality. So one of the things that Job needs to hear from Elihu is that when life seems unfair, we know that God is always doing right. He could not do anything but right. And one of the things you need to do, Job, is remind yourself of the character of God. Remind yourself of his character. Think about him being the ruler, the sovereign, the just one, the one who does not need anything but provides everything that his people needs. That leads us to the third thing. Even when life is hard, Elihu says to Job, you need to know that God is not heartless. That's what chapter 35 is about. Even when life is hard, God is not heartless. Heartless. I want you to look with me in chapter 35 at a little section that will ring true to you because you've heard this phrase before, remember, never thought about it being in the book of Job. But look at chapter 35, verse 9. 
Because of the multitude of oppressions, they cry out. They cry for help because of the arm of the mighty. But no one says, where is God, my maker? Listen to how he describes him. Who gives songs in the night. So what here Elihu does is when he says, life is hard, Job. I know it's hard for you. You don't understand why you're going through this, but I need you to know, Job, that God gives songs in the night. Now, the note I gave you there in Matthew 26, 30 is a passage that says that right before Jesus went out to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, right? Where he's getting ready to go and be crucified on a cross. Remember what it says there? And that right before they went out, they sang a hymn. They sang a hymn. In fact, in Acts 16, when Paul and Silas are in prison at midnight, they're in prison, shackled for preaching the gospel. And that is very hard. That is very difficult. But what do they do in Acts 16? It says at midnight, Paul and Silas began to, you know what they did, church? They sang. (laughs) They sang. And so Elihu was saying, listen, Job, I get it. Life is hard, but God is not heartless. Heartless, He is not against you. He understands your suffering, and guess what? He is the one who will give a song in the night. Now, let me tell you the difference between singing a song and whistling, okay? I've come up here to this church in the middle of the night when the alarm system goes off, right? And it's 3 o'clock in the morning, and it's black, and the police are outside, and uh, they want me to walk through the building and see if there's anybody in the building, right? When I'm walking through the building, I've done this on many occasions. I'm coming through the building, and I'm going. (laughs) (laughs) Now, that is not in any way a sign of confidence, right? (laughs) I just want to make some noise in case there's somebody around the corner. The difference of a whistling in the night and a song in the night is that the song is an expression of triumph. When Jesus is getting ready to go to that cross, And he pulls the disciples together for that last final time together. It says they sang a hymn and then they went out. He wasn't whistling in the dark. He's singing a song. And whenever Paul and Silas are in prison, they're not whistling in there. It says they're singing because there's a sense of triumph in their heart. Now listen, Elihu says, Job, I want you to know there's a couple of things that you need to keep clear. Even when life is confusing, God is communicating with you. He's not saying things you want to hear right now, but He is at least reminding you in your dreams of things you know. He's actually using your suffering to get your attention. He's causing others to say things to you that you need to hear. Not only that, Job, life might seem unfair, but you know, Job, that God is not unjust. Just think of His character. Think of the kind of God He is and what He's revealed to you in His Word. And though life seems hard, God is not heartless. Surely, surely the God who is for you and not against you should cause you to sing a song, a song of triumph. And then lastly, the fourth thing that Elihu says to Job, and it covers two chapters, and it's this. Even when life becomes unsettled, God is not unseated. You see, his life is all messed up. It's gone sideways. He doesn't know why he's going through this. But he does want him to know that God is still on the throne. As you read in these chapters, you'll see the first thing that he does in chapters 36 is he reminds Job of the terrible end of sinners. Just remember, Job, you won't end in the place they will. Those who have rejected the God you know, the God who has loved you and you have by faith turned to and that you have sought to live for, as chapter 1 outlined about his life, just know your life will never end up like theirs. And Job is reminded here that God... His world is unsettled, Job. He's not unseated. He is in charge. You might be looking at those people thinking they are getting away with everything. Here, I'm living for you. Look how my life is going sideways and turned upside down. Seems like life is good for them. But he says to Job, no, you need to remember there's an end for those sinners. You should jot down somewhere, it's not in your notes there, but Psalm 73 is a psalm where David is crying out to God about the prosperity of the wicked around him. They don't care about God, they don't pursue God, they ignore that God, and yet he says they are like those who are very fat. And that's a good thing in their day. That meant you had a lot of stuff and and looked like blessings were all around you. And David says, but for me... It looks as if I have washed my hands in vain. It's like I have wasted my time. 
because everything is going wrong for me and I'm following you. And what David in the psalm then turns around and says, I'd almost given up until I went into the sanctuary of God and then I remembered their end. It might look good for them now, but the end is horrible for them. And that's what Elihu is reminding Job of here, that God is in control of even the sinner, those who don't know him and don't care about him, and their end is not a good one. And the last thing he does is Elihu reminded Job of the terrible end of sinners. And secondly, the thing he does is he reminded him that God was in control of all the seasons, of all the seasons. Everything about Job's life, is a reminder to him that Job, if God can control the wind, the snow, the rain, all those things, surely he's got his hand on your life and he controls all things. That's what chapters 36 to 27, or chapter 36, 27 through chapter 37, verse 14 has to do. So what does all that say to us this morning? What is that going to remind us of? We're going to wrap this up with just two quick points of application. I know it's kind of like a whole big thing to have to try to cover in such a short while. I was thinking through this of something that Ronald Reagan used to say when there was a big amount of stuff to say. He said, he said it's kind of like this. A young preacher guy went to a church for his first sermon to preach, and when he got there, there was just one old guy sitting in the auditorium. And he asked the guy, he said, well, uh, what, what should I do? He said, well, I'm here and you're here. He said, if I was a farmer, and I am, and I went out and I found one of my herd out in the field, what I would do is I'd feed them, so why don't you get up there and preach? So he did, and at the end, uh, so he preached, and he preached, and he preached for about an hour and a half, and he went back there, and he said, well, what do you think? He said, well, I don't know much. I'm just an old farmer. He said, but if I went out in the field, and I saw one of my herd, I would feed them, but I wouldn't feed them the whole load. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you got the whole load here, right? I trust you're going to go back and look through this and work through this. But it's very important for us to remember that Elihu has been a voice that Job needed to hear. What has he done for us? What has he reminded us of? First of all, Elihu has cautioned us to watch out for how we get angry sometimes. Now, Elihu is one of those who I think both gets righteously angry and sinfully angry. But I do think he's pretty upset at Job and his friends for a right cause. He's like, Job, you really should not be thinking some of these thoughts you've had and wanting to die. I get how you're struggling with this, but that's just not the way to think, Job. And that would be a righteous concern. When he begins to, in chapters 37, verse uh, 4, 34 verse 7, he talks about Job saying Job has just gone the wrong way and Job has messed up his life. He's probably sinfully angry at that point. So he goes back and forth. But it's really important to know that when you are struggling through issues of life that you can't figure out why you're going through it, and if you're trying to help someone through that, you might reach a point to where you get a little frustrated with the process. And Elihu is cautioning us to guard our anger. As James 1.20 says, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. You'll never see and help that person be ready to hear what God wants to say if you're just angry and fed up with what they have to say don't be like Elihu and fall into the trap of getting sinfully angry when you're having to deal with people who are going through difficult times watch out for that guard your anger watch out for it now some of you and I think I just want to pause there for a minute some of you might say well well my anger is righteous towards the situation I'm struggling with it may be there is a place, as Ephesians 4.26 tells us, that um, there is a righteous kind of anger. I get it. Be angry and do not sin. I get that. But maybe sometimes we might just want to pause and do what you do when you're watching a sporting event. You know when there's a question as to whether that was the right call or not or whether something happened, what do they do? They review the play, right? And when they review the play, they slow it down, they look at it, and they go, you know what? That was a right call or that was a wrong call. Sometimes the call might be reversed. Because how you first saw it didn't look like it was really wrong. Or didn't look like it was right. But it was either way, you missed it. So when we slow down sometimes and ask ourselves, am I in that situation sinfully angry? Just reviewing the play, as it were, to use that analogy, might cause us to want to change the call. 
Watch out that we don't fall into the trap that Elihu falls into of getting angry. Because anger is never for the good of the other. It's always about me. It's always something I'm not getting. I'm not having what I want. I'm not getting to do the things I want because you're taking my time. Or I'm angry because you're not seeing it the way I see it. Those are all sinful types of anger. So be cautious for that. And number two, be ready to help a person who is challenged with their struggles and suffering. Elihu is challenging us to prepare others, our own souls as well, for the suffering that we're going through. Remember what Elihu says in chapters 32 to 37 are all preparatory. They're just getting people ready. What does that mean? Well, that means helping that person to grasp, your own soul to grasp, that though life is confusing, the same four points, though life is confusing, God is still communicating. You're not hearing right now what you want to hear, but He is talking to you. Listen to those things. Help that person, help your own soul realize that though life seems unfair, God is not unjust. He's not doing you wrong. When you're struggling through that, remember that life, though it is hard, God is not heartless. He is on your side. Sing that song of triumph, the song in the night. And when life becomes unsettled, realize that God is not unseated. He's got sinners. He's got the seasons of the world. He's got everything under control. You need to remember that and hold on to that great and glorious truth. Let me close with this story, and our men are going to come, and we're going to receive the communion here at the closing part of the service. Just one of those four things I want you to think about as you think about helping others to prepare for their suffering, and that is just remembering the kind of God that we belong to, that He is not heartless. Some of you know who Johnny Erickson Tata is. I've told you stories about spending time with her and what her take is on her suffering and her struggle. What some of you may or may not know is there's a, many books she's written, but a good book you ought to have in your library is a book by Dr. John MacArthur and Johnny Erickson Tata. It's a combination work where they took all the great hymns that we sing, and in that book, she's talking about the hymns she loves, and he's writing the theological foundations and truths for why we sing those hymns. So in that book, let me just share one closing story to show you what I mean about listening to the challenge to help a sufferer, help your own soul through those times. In the book there, there's a story told about Dr. James Dobson's mother's passing. Her name is Myrtle. I'll read it for you right here. In a few minutes, we were sitting on the edge of Myrtle Dobson's bed, suffering from Parkinson's disease, which rendered her confused. She was unable to speak for more than a word or two at a time. Dr. Dobson spoke kindly to his mother, reminding her who we, we all were, even though we had known her very well. She just nodded and smiled, and after a few minutes of small talk, Bobby, one of the guests, spoke up. Why don't we sing? Myrtle loves to sing. That's how we remind ourselves of the triumph that we have in God. So we did sing, and we sang these words. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above. Oh, gratefully sing His power and His love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. For the first few lines of the hymn, she silently smiled back at us. Could she understand? Was she listening? We really couldn't tell. But as we sang the final verse, her mouth began to form the words. Then she joined in with each unforgettable word. What was even more amazing was than Myrtle's remembering the lyrics was the fact that she sang a perfect alto. The music may not have landed a record contract, but it was good enough to fill our hearts with enough gratitude and praise to a last a lifetime. Frail children of dust, she sang, and feeble as frail. In thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Your mercies, how tender, how firm to the end, our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. That's what I mean, helping a sufferer even try to sing the songs of triumph. Just one of four things that Elihu is reminding us that when life is hard, remember God is not heartless. Sing those songs and remind yourself of those. Let's pray together as our men come forward.